Good morning, everyone. I am happy to welcome, welcome you to our final breakfast series, our final Seedman Secchia breakfast series for this school year. And I'm happy to recognize uh, President Haas is with us today. Uh, Dean Lawson is with us today and uh, many, many other notables here today. And so um, I really appreciate that. Um, now is a good time, if you haven't, to uh, mute your cell phones so that we don't have any of those interruptions. And I'd also like to recognize uh, another very important group to us is we have a bunch of students here. So we have students out here. There's a whole table. Is that a Seedman student table? Yep, whole Seedman student. Looks like we have a whole Seed Seedman student table over there. So we appreciate you guys taking time out of your uh, college schedules to come and uh, hear our speakers today and learn uh, what's going on. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to ask uh, Gleaves Whitney. He's the director of the Hauenstein Center for Presidential Studies. <laughs> Took me for a second there. And Governor John Engler, they'll be our uh, speakers today, if you'd like to join me. Come on up. And then uh, I'm going to ask Ambassador Sekia to come up and introduce our speakers today. I suspect we all know where Ambassador Sekia was yesterday. Did <laughs> In, in fact, I mentioned to uh, the ambassador uh, that he looked shorter to me behind uh, Magic Johnson on the TV <laughs> last night. So, uh, so you should be mic'd up. So this is this is all yours. I am mic'd up. It's okay. Magic. Good. Thanks. <laughs> I uh, I have an opportunity this morning to introduce a dear friend, but I think I want to go at it a different way because a lot of you are looking at politics. And it's a place you don't want to be. But it isn't as nasty as the press makes it look. Uh, they're underpaid, probably underfed, and probably uh, undereducated. They just write and scream at people sometimes and make politicians look bad. And politicians have to explain to their spouse why they've decided to put their family in front of that kind of introspection and the criticisms that come because everybody makes mistakes. My wife reminds me of mine often. <laughs> and, and the problem is that most of the people I've met in politics are good people. The far right, the strangers, the weirdos like Dave Ajima, who I don't agree with, by the way, but he had, they're not leaders of the party. It's people like John Engler who were distinct and proud leaders of a political party. And they happen to be in the political party that controls West Michigan, which is one of the reasons why we have a very vibrant economy over here. But the bottom line is that John, when I first met him, was a young man in the Senate. He'd been one of the youngest members of the legislature in the history of our state. And he was studying government. He studied it well. He learned it well. He was probably the most knowledgeable governor we ever had. And it's interesting. Jerry Ford is said to be the man who knew the budget better than any president we've ever had. He knew every line of the budget from his appropriation committee days when he was on the military side of appropriations. However, John Engler was the most knowledgeable in our government we've had in years. And I speak that publicly right now, even with my friend being in the governorship, uh, Rick Snyder, but this man had studied, had learned, and served us well. So I'm honored that he's here to represent uh, our speaker series this morning. I've always admired John. We were in Rome when he won his election, and we looked at each other, and I said to Joan, no, yes, what? Uh, it was like he just came out of nowhere, and he was down, and like John, in past experience, he's always been underestimated. He has been a magnificent leader, He's now the head of the Business Roundtable, which is several hundred of the largest corporations in the world. And he runs their office in Washington. He's been a governor for 12 years, probably the way the Constitution is now written, the only 12-year governor that we'll ever have in the rest of the history of Michigan. So I'm honored to have a good friend here and a man who not only 
is known as one of the best governors we ever had, but he's the father of the triplets, which are now as old as most of you students, which is going to shock uh, the others in this room. But those three girls are now attending Stanford, William and Mary, and that other place in Ann Arbor. I can't remember. That. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're proud of them too. And John, welcome to Grand Rapids. Thank Good you. Luck, John. Governor, welcome back to your home state. Thank you very much. Great I, to be here this morning. I worked with you for 11 years, so we're going to continue a conversation that we started a long time ago, and uh, we talked about a lot of issues about e economic growth, what is the infrastructure you need, what kinds of policies have to be enacted. We're going to get to those in a minute, but I think the most pressing thing to ask you this morning is, how did you survive the end of that game yesterday? <laughs> it was a great, a great day for Michigan, and uh, a great day for Spartans everywhere. I, I do want to acknowledge Cleves, uh, Peter's very generous introduction. Thank you. Those are, those are very kind words, and maybe we'll get into a little bit. But one of the reasons that the, the tenure that I enjoyed is not possible is because of term limits today, which I think has been sort of, a, as it turned out, a plague on Michigan government because it's just deprived the state of the uh, institutional memory that comes from longer service. And when somebody can be in the House of Representatives only six years, I was there only eight, but, uh, but six years is pretty quick. And so we have a situation in Washington today. Peter talked about the experience that I gained. Um, I've been 12 years in the legislature before I became a, a leader in the Senate. And uh, you, you, you acquire a lot of access to information, a lot of knowledge during that time. And, uh, and that's very helpful. And uh, you, you do get to learn the budget or you get to learn different policy areas today and um, it's sort of like Groundhog Day. Now everything's kind of new all over again every day for folks there because they, they just don't have the background. And, and I mean imagine, and now I was looking at the paper, I, I don't know Senator Meekoff, the, uh, the latest in a distinguished succession of uh, Senate Majority Leaders is here this morning. I congratulate him on his, his leadership, but I, you know, you're, you're, it's a 50 some billion dollar budget and you're putting people in charge of who've been there two years or four years in the House of Representatives, your committee chairs. Pretty big gamble. And, and that's one of the things that I think is an impact on politics, not just in Michigan, but in other states around, around the country. Probably not going to change for a while. Governor Blanchard and I both think it should. Uh, and that's, uh, that's one of those factors that, that comes into play uh, in terms of people uh, if you're putting them on the board of directors of the state, you'd like them to have some familiarity with maybe what's actually going on in, in, the, in the state. But we'll, we'll get into all of that, I'm sure, and maybe more. But uh, I'm just delighted to be back here. Michelle and I had a great time over the weekend. We were with Peter and Joan, and Peter brought me back here last night so I could be here this morning. So I, I thank him for that. It's great to see him. It's great to see so many people that, uh, in, as I look around the room, there's a few faces, including not just leaves John Truscott, who for years uh, was our press secretary and managed communications. We, got, we had a wonderful team, and that's the other thing that I, I will say, and I, I've noted that certainly in many of the West Michigan institutions, but uh, the continuity that comes from having a strong team and being able to build really is important. We run, in 1990 we were elected governor, just a little historical footnote, we actually had five paid staffers. I think I was at five. And the whole campaign probably, the primary and the general, probably was less than, I don't know, five, six million dollars or something. I mean, it was uh, <coughs> you know, how things have changed, not just here again, but all over the country. It's really been amazing to watch. And, and I, it's very hard to imagine that actually the career I enjoyed would even be possible today, even for, I, I would actually go so far as to say it would not be possible under today's laws today's term limits, you, you could not uh, repeat what I was fortunate enough to be able to do. And you were able to amass a knowledge over more than three decades in public service in Michigan that would be impossible today if you're in elected office here in Michigan. Uh, the, the loss for our state, uh, just in terms of the human capital in Lansing right now, must be uh, significant from your point of view in terms of tackling the problems we face. Well, it, 
you know, we, we talk at the business roundtable, there's 208 companies that are part of that roundtable, and so they represent an aggregate some $7 trillion in, in revenues. But, but to, to make the point, we, we work with those companies, and there's, there's great continuity, and one, yet one of the things they worry about, even as big as they are, is, is sort of the role of activist investors in, in short-term thinking versus long-term investment strategy. Well, you, you get the same thing in, in politics. I mean, if it's, if it's just short-term, uh, then, then you're not really looking down the road. One of the things we were very proud of, and it took a long time, but John was part of this, when we finally got to a AAA bond rating. Michigan had not had a AAA bond rating more than 25 years. And we would make our annual treks to New York to the rating agency and say, what do we have to do? What do we need to do? And there were all kinds of things they wanted us to do uh, to show that the creditworthiness was there. Well, that's a, that was a long-term investment to get that done. It's just simply something you wouldn't be able to do if you're there for four years or you know, even eight, I guess. It, it took us 10. Uh, of course, my successor lost it in about a year and a half. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but in places like Virginia, where I, where Michelle and I are at the moment temporarily, uh, you know, it's a it's a big deal. It's a political issue if the AAA bond rating is threatened. The United States had its AAA bond rating threatened and and actually a, a downgrade at one point by Standard and Poor's. And boy, that that just sent shockwaves everywhere. And and I think those things matter. And so. You're, you're right. I think uh, a longer-term focus is really important, and some of that comes with some uh, experience, and some of it comes with substantive poly policy background. Well, since you did have more than three decades of experience here, I was three decades at the end. It wasn't at the beginning. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've had more than a decade of experience in Washington D.C., working with a lot of different kinds of institutions there, government and private sector institutions. Uh, how has your opinion of democracy, the way our country works, how has that changed when you compare the two venues? Well, I'm still an optimist. I still think leadership matters, and I think you see this uh, everywhere because you see it at the state level. You know, you, you, leadership can change. It goes from one direction to another, and all of a sudden things start to pick up. We're seeing that in Michigan at the moment. Uh, I think in Washington, uh, we're just a you know, maybe a, maybe a few leaders, maybe one leader away from from things really starting to move. We we our our view, uh, I'll say, well, I can say our view because it is the organization's view. The roundtable believes that we're underperforming economically. Uh, while we've had this very slow recovery, I mean, it's, we're going on nine years where we've not had a GDP growth above three percent in the country. Coming out of the kind of depths of the recession we had in 08, 09, you would have expected historically at least much more robust growth than it, this is, uh, I had a fellow tell me the other day, he was giving a talk and he said, you know, this is the slowest recovery we've had since the Great Depression. And a fellow who was a friend of his, and man I know well, actually he's out at Stanford, said, no, it's actually the slowest recovery since we started keeping records. Uh, because it, it, it's not to say it's not a recovery, it is, things are better. I mean, we've been adding jobs, a few jobs every month. But we went down so far that coming back has been difficult. The participation in the workforce is still down. Some of that's demographic. But that doesn't explain it all. Uh, and, and there's no question that wages have been hammered. And, and, and it's, it's interesting, given the sort of the, I guess, the philosophy of being in the White House a little bit, that some of those have fallen most harshly upon people who can least afford it, too. And so uh, we've seen, uh, you know, youth unemployment's been. Uh, extraordinarily high, minority unemployment uh, much higher, and it hasn't. It, it we've I think squandered a period with these low interest rates where we haven't made the kind of investments. And I know Michigan's got a big debate underway now, but I mean we we should have as a nation been making a lot of these investments that we've been deferring. One of the things we were proud of in the 90s is that uh, it was a it was a good time. Uh, President Haas here, I mean for higher education, we were, we were making a lot of investments and in a lot of the the physical plant and trying to get uh, operating budgets in a little better shape because we 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 believed that uh, that that higher education knowledge was going to be a, a differentiator among states. Still do I think that, I used to say the states with the best schools win. I think that still is true. I also think it's true that nation with the best schools 
wins. <coughs> and, and by that, we don't mean just higher education. We're actually, uh, we're, we're really very concerned about the district K-12 education in America. I don't know if you know the statistic, but imagine this. We spend $700 billion a year, and at the end of the third grade nationally, end of the third grade, you'd say, well, gee, the child has been in school for kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. Probably every child's reading proficiently by then. I was asking J.C. Heisinger what the, you know, if he had his statistics at his fingertips. And, and he said, somebody stays four years, they're, they're going to be reading proficiently in a, one of his academies. But, but nationally, 36% is the number that can read proficiently after four years at the end of the third grade. That's just, that's just not acceptable. We, we cannot, we can't make it with that kind of performance. We, and I've, there's been a lot of debate about education in a lot of different ways, but I've said, okay, I'm, I'm down to one measurement now. <coughs> can we not teach the children to read? Could we, can, let's, let's, let's set that as a goal. Let's get 100% of the children reading proficiently at the end of third grade. Could we do that as a nation? Because if we can't, I mean, then your conversations about what we're going to learn in science or how well we're going to do math seem kind of fanciful. Well, you're dealing with all of these business leaders from around the world, and uh, they have worldwide experience. What do you hear from them is the most essential thing that we get right? Is it education, and what else is there? Uh, actually, I would say for, for the, the U.S. headquartered companies, uh, it, it, is, it is people. I mean, human capital is becoming critical. I mean, if West Michigan wants to set itself aside, it would double down you know, on, on education, and you'd, you'd want to be a region, you'd say, look, a child goes to West Michigan school, there is no question when they're, you know, when they start school, you know, they're going to learn to read, and, and I, I've said the education agenda could be the following for America. Uh, we, we need to get to the point where every child that goes to the end of high school age who goes to college can do so without needing remediation when we get there. We're spending billions on remediation in college trying to close the gap that existed uh, when that person got a diploma and now is trying to do college work but finds out they're not ready to do it. So going to college without needing remediation or since uh, and, and today's economy does not need everybody to go to college. So that, that, that is a, also a canard, I guess, that should be dispelled here that you need to go to college. But you do need to have skills and today the workforce uh, a lot of talk about white collar, blue collar. Well, a blue collar job is being replaced by something that I think might better be described as a blue tech job because the technology that's used today is so ubiquitous, it's in everything, and so you've got to be prepared uh, to, you know, whether it's uh, you're, you're, you're usually carrying a computer with you, you're, you're, you're doing things uh, in, in terms of statistical reporting and uh, measurement and all of that. So, so you've got to be high tech. So if you don't go to college, you need to be able to go to the workforce with a skill. And hopefully that's a skill that's been measured and certified based on industry you know, you know, standards. If you, if you can get, and that's where business and, in, business and industry and education have to work closer together. And then the third point of the education agenda is no dropouts. Uh, a, a dropout is a most catastrophic life decision anyone can make. Because there simply isn't a U.S. economy that's got a lot of jobs for unskilled labor. Uh, and in fact, the, some of the unskilled jobs are jobs that apparently, even if, even if they're available, uh, many Native born Americans don't wish to do them. And uh, you hear this in the ag sector a lot. Uh, Governor Barber down in Mississippi, when he was there, he used to say, we wouldn't have a poultry industry in Mississippi if we didn't have immigrants coming into the country. Uh, some said that about dairy farms here, even in Michigan. You look at who's working in those uh, milking parlors and they're milking thousands of cows. It isn't somebody who said, I, you know, I don't have a skill, so I'll go milk cows because that's seven days a week and <coughs> people aren't interested in that. So those are the, that education. The second item to your, your question in talking to these leaders, I think we've got to have a competitive policy environment and, and right at the top of that list is, is tax reform. I mean, the U.S. tax codes uh, hopelessly out of date. It was terrific in 86 when it was modernized. Hasn't been changed since then and we've fallen dramatically behind the rest of the world. And it's one of the reasons that you've read these stories we just, about, about companies 
being exported in other parts of the world. I mean, the capital, the two things that are mobile today, people and money, or capital. And, and, and they're going to go uh, wherever they can. Uh, and I, I would argue that uh, we, we need to get that right. And uh, there, there are other issues. I would certainly put trade issues, immigration reform, are all on that list, too, of, of, of important issues. But, uh, but education for the human capital and tax reform on the financial side. Governor, what do you think is actually most doable <coughs> in today's climate in Washington, D.C.? What's most doable of the reforms that you advocate? I, I think there's an opportunity for tax reform. Uh, in part uh, because of something you're, again, you're dealing with here in Michigan, uh, but the Highway Trust Fund is uh, not funded. It's got a big deficit in it. Uh, it's been short ever since they passed it in terms of the, the cash tax revenues aren't there. They don't bring in what they used to. And uh, so I think there's a way to sort of deal with that and to deal with uh, uh, tax reform because of the, the job impact. We, business is a tax collector. I mean, it, you know, in effect, I mean, business collects taxes, puts in the price of the product, passes it along. We used to say that in Michigan, and it was kind of a, and, and some of you, I know Peter's old enough, I, I probably, you know, others may not be, but, uh, you know, you remember how uh, you can drive people out of the state. It, we used to have an out-migration that was pretty significant. We were losing jobs to other parts of the country. I mean, we, you, it wasn't that long ago people would say in Michigan, well, they can't build cars in Alabama. There's more than 100,000 auto workers in Alabama. So we, we lost jobs not overseas first. We lost them to other parts of the country in Michigan because we weren't competitive. And, and a lot of things go into that. And, and now our nation is, is facing that. That's why that's a motivator for tax reform to come back to that. What, what's possible? I, I, I think, although it, it, it is no small feat, actually, to persuade Washington, everybody sort of gets it that Michigan and Ohio, Indiana, we compete. Michigan competes against the South and the Southwest, you know, and they compete against us, and everybody's going to compete against, everybody's been clobbering Illinois because of their bad situation down there. Uh, when Indiana adopts a right to work status, I mean, it changes the game in the Midwest, then Michigan, you know, then <coughs> Wisconsin, they follow suit. All, all to better be able to compete. Well, today, nations are competing the way the states have competed for a long time. That's the point that's so basic and gets missed in Washington. Nations are competing today just like states have competed for a long time. And we, we understand how states compete. We, everybody in this room knows that, that uh, you know, the governor of Texas was forever going into California with these raiding parties and trying to invite people who from California, Texas, a lot of people did do that. We get that. Well, now, you know, Canada is trying to get people to move to Canada or, or you know, somebody trying to get you to move to the EU. So we have to be aware of that competition. You say, well, I don't like that. Well, we may not like it, but it's a, it's a reality. You can't build, and for the U.S., because we're such a, an important production nation, we've got about 4% of the world's population. <coughs> We will not have nearly as much wealth as a nation if we just concentrate on selling to each other. We kind of need the 96% of those customers that live elsewhere in the world. And so we, we better figure out how can we go out and a lot of the younger people that are in this room are going to, in their lives, be part of companies and be in jobs themselves where they're going to travel. I mean, that's part of the full Seedman Center here is when you're thinking globally, what's the business like? Well, a lot of it's global business today. I predict in another 20 years, the CEOs that are at the business roundtable, the, the vast majority are U.S. born, but it is changing. And I think that change is going to pick up because I think these global companies are going to tend to have leadership options that are not just going to be U.S. born. And, and there's some of that today. Well, I mean, Chrysler is run by, you know, Sergio Marchione from Italy, so, you know, Andrew Livers runs Dow, was actually born in Australia. So, I mean, you're going to, you, you've got examples right here in the state, but, but you're going to see many more in the future. And, and for a young person here who wants to lead a company, you're going to be part of one of those companies, you're, you're going to have to be thinking somewhat globally. Well, the Business Roundtable recently released, uh, I think, a report on immigration study. And uh, I think we'd very much like to hear your thoughts further on immigration because you have, 
You've always maintained that immigration has been such a positive in the manufacturing sector, for example. Well, I think here's, here's the situation we've got. It's real straightforward. We've got a lot of people in the country, estimates are as many as 11 million, uh, give or take, I guess, a million, who knows. Uh, but, but a lot of people are here illegally. About half of them are here illegally after coming legally and then overstaying visas. So they came and they saw and they stayed, you know, basically. And, and our system is so uh, broken that it, 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 it never addressed this. So I think, uh, so the first question to ask, I think, is this. Is there any, are there any conceivable circumstances under which 11 million people will be rounded up and removed from the country? And, and most people would say, well, gosh, I don't think that's probably going to happen. I, I think you're right. I, I, I don't think it will happen. And I think there's very few in elective office, either at the federal or the state level, who are actually advocates of an 11 million person roundup. So that's probably not going to happen. So now you're debating, okay, under what circumstances do people stay? And the reason I start with that is because you've got to, that is, that is the challenge. You've got, to, you've got to sort that out in order to figure out what the policy is. Right? Because I think it's, it's pretty clear to me, I mean, baseball season's about ready to start. And even if you look at the Detroit Tigers roster, I mean, Miguel Cabrera is not native born. I sure like him on the Tigers team, but if he couldn't come here from his home country of Venezuela and play ball, or, you know, I, I don't know who else we've got, you know, Martinez and Iglesias, we've got a whole bunch of people from all over the world. The defending NBA champions of basketball, pro basketball playoffs are about to start. I mean, the Spurs, I think, were from, they were the defending champions. I think they had seven nations or something on their team. Well, it can't be really the policy of the United States that sports teams get to have the best players in the world, but companies don't get to have the best engineers, the best scientists, the best chemists from the world. I mean, really? We, we ought to be able to compete for that, so I think we kind of know what we need to do there. Then we also know that there's a certain number of jobs, and I mentioned them earlier. Uh, you know, if, you're, if you want to have industries like Many of the agriculture communities that uh, you don't have, uh, there's other, the other sectors. There probably needs to be a, some kind of temporary worker program or, you know, you're going to have to sort that out. Uh, and I think the most important thing is if, if you deal with 11 million people here legally, how do you make sure the next time there isn't 20 million? What's the enforcement? And, and I think the debate about securing the border has been misplaced. We've argued, look, Think about this from an enforcement perspective. And here's, here's it's, it's not that hard. Everybody's made it very political, but it seemingly isn't that hard because we now have the technology with the E-Verify system. Every one of us who flies and get on a plane, out come the ID. You walk into most every office building in Washington, out comes the ID. Well, the same thing is going to be true for hiring. And a lot of companies, there are probably some in here who use E-Verify today, but that system will be in place once we determine the status of the 11 million. If you're going to work, you're going to have to go through the E-Verify system. And so there will be no incentive to come and be here illegally because you aren't going to be able to work. And if you work off the books and Mr. or Ms. Employer hires you, they're going to have heavy sanctions in the future. And those will be enforced. So that, that changes, it seems to me. And so what we, what we need to do is clarify the status of 11 million. And people say, well, do they become citizens? Maybe, maybe not. I, you know, I think for starters, probably not. And they, do they get a green card? No. You probably get a purple card. We create something new. And, and we let everybody come out of the shadows. If you don't come out of the shadows at that point, then you're treated as somebody who just arrived, just walked across the border, just overstayed a visa. And then the local law enforcement agencies have to have the support of the federal government that if they find someone who's here illegally, then they're removed. I mean, that's in the future. That's the way it will be, and and that's the way it is. In most other, most every other country around the world. We just have had a policy of, you know, you know, described derisively as catch and release, but that's really what it's been. And so that pretty soon it's no reason to catch because it, it's just leading to a release, and and that then the whole thing breaks down. That's what has to be fixed. I don't think this is complicated, and uh, and I think that we we want to. The nation with the best talent wins. I said the best schools, but really it's the best talent. You'd like them to come through your schools, but that's the other reality. If you can't sort of grow your own, if you can't create your talent, then what do you, have, what do, you do? You've got to find it. 
If you can't bring the talent here, what's your other option? You go to where you can get the talent. Microsoft built a huge research development facility up in Vancouver, Canada. Why did they do that? Because the immigration, Canada, immigration laws in Canada were much easier to work with, so they could bring scientists from all over the world there. One of the things we found in the immigration study that we did, and a lot of this stuff is in the study, brt.org, it's all there, but something else that's in the study is that you know, we're lagging nations in attracting and holding talent. I was talking to a Canadian ambassador at a dinner last week, and he was saying, well, you know, we have a specific program. We watch for visa expirations in your country so we can go persuade those people that you don't have to leave. Uh, you, you might have to go. He said, you know, you don't have to leave and go very far. You can just come north to Kennedy. So yeah, it's a little colder, but we'll get your parka. We've got great jobs. <laughs> I mean, they're going to school off us. We're, we're paying for the education, and then they're getting the benefit. That, that just seems to me to be an unsupportable policy. And that's, that's what makes you crazy about some of the members of Congress who, are, who want to give you a sound bite but aren't dealing with the problem. Right. I want to make it clear that in the format this morning, we're going to open this up to your questions here in just a minute or two. So start thinking about what you'd like to ask the governor. Um, you work with so many CEOs, very, very bright people. And could you reflect for the young people in the room especially, what, what are the qualities of a great CEO from your perspective, a, a real leader in the business community? Well, uh, you, you've got some great CEOs in the room, but take, take Peter. He's, he's a great CEO. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, they're smart. They know their business. Uh, they're, I think today, 21st century business leaders are real, real inclusive. I mean, they're not, uh, again, it's, it comes down to talent. Uh, very few... And I, uh, very few uh, are anything but just impressive <laughs> sort of captains of the team. I mean, they, they are, you, these enterprises are so big, it can't just be about, about the, the CEO, the one person. I mean, they're, they're building, you know, if, if you look at Universal, there, there's a culture there that started with Peter Secchia that, that continues through Matt Massad today in the company. Well, I think winning companies build these winning cultures, and, and I think that's, that's a big part of the, of, the, of the challenge today of leadership. I think, uh, so the ability to recruit and identify talent, to not limit yourself to talent from wherever that comes, and, and today, uh, a much more diverse economy that we've got, a much more diverse world with lots of emerging from poverty populations in different continents and different countries. So I think, you know, they're, they're global in their perspective, too. That's something else that's the companies that I'm working with are, are primarily global. So it's amazing how much travel. I think that's the other thing. They've got to be, uh, and there are many more women today as CEOs, but I mean, uh, regardless of their, their backgrounds, almost all of them, when they get to the top, have spent some time now internationally. They've probably lived or worked or been responsible for international activities of some sort. They've traveled extensively and travel uh, an unbelievable amount. We, we just released a, a month ago, I think, our meeting dates for 2017. That's, we, we try to get our meeting dates on schedules way out in advance because we're dealing with <coughs> horrific schedules. We'll have 85, 90 CEOs at each. We meet four times a year. We'll have that many CEOs, so it's an impressive gathering when it happens, but, you know, everybody's you know, somebody's just about to get on a plane, go to Asia. Somebody's just arrived back. Somebody's going here, going there. They're they're on they're on planes all the time. Uh, but they build very strong teams. They have strong cultures. I think, you, you know, if you were to say uh, contrast that to maybe the executive leadership in the White House today, you you cannot possibly make all decisions in in one office. I mean, you you've got to be able to delegate. And I think one of the challenges for the next president will be to reinstate some type of cabinet form of government where you actually do delegate authority out to agencies. I mean, we had, we were blessed with very strong department directors. I mean, you, you know, obviously uh, Mark Murray is well known in this community, but Mark played a, an invaluable role in our administration. There were a lot of other people like Mark, uh, Jim Haveman, who's well known again in the Grand Rapids area. You know, strong leaders, and uh, uh, Patty Woodworth, who was our first bunch. You know, we had. We had a lot of women in key spots. We had a lot of diverse talent that we were able to assemble, and they stayed a long time. And I think that, that that's also 
uh, something that I see. If you're, if you're seeing somebody who's kind of got a revolving door, you're just not working so well. And, and I think that one of the things that today everyone pays a lot of attention, there's much more transparency today and social media has changed all of this. I mean, there's nothing much that, you, you know, you don't expect that something's going on that somebody's not going to know about. I mean, in that respect, there's not much difference between being a CEO and being a, you know, an elected governor. I mean, the, you know, it's all, it's all kind of out there today. And if you think it's not, you're, you're making a mistake and you're going to get burned. Let's open this up. I know the audience members have questions. What would you like to ask the governor? There's no time to be bashful. No, we have a question over here. Hey, guys, uh, my name is Bryce Bailey. I'm a senior here at Grand Valley. And my question for you is, looking back at your time in various offices, there obviously were things that you um, had to put on the back burner. What do you mean because of time restraints um, time strength and different resources? So is there anything that you put on the back burner that you kind of wish you would have put on the forefront? And if so, how do you really kind of advocate for that now? The, uh, the one thing I've always said, if I could get a do-over, uh, we would have started much quicker with our sort of data analytics. We, I was governor during the Y2K, the transition into the new millennium, and uh, John's smiling back there, but you know, we, we probably lost two and a half years of, I mean, nobody knew what was gonna happen. There was all this talk that these computers were gonna crash, you know, that programs weren't gonna work, and so we spent literally millions of dollars documenting you know tens of millions of lines of code it was a non-event but it but it took us off when i when i came to the governor's office I mean, let me give you perspective here in 1991 we put in the first sort of integrated computer system i mean an email system we all that stuff was new i mean this stuff is everything that everybody takes for granted was was just being installed but had we doubled down on i think how we use data. And we set up a Center for Education, Performance, and Improvement, the old CEPI. It still survives, actually. But we should have done a much better job on what I call data analytics. It was kind of new then, maybe, but uh, we were trying to do more of this. But I think if we, because I think transparency is really important, and we, we, we have got to have greater accountability. And, and I think that's where we, we, we failed, because I, then I think it might have led to the case that people say, well, wait a minute. You mean to say we're spending, you know, eighty thousand dollars on this child's education, and we've got a child who can't read, we're going to drop out of school? What what's wrong with this picture? And and I, that to me, you know, the the, the changes that we could have made in education. The other that that is an absolute curse on this state is the dysfunctional Department of Education and State Superintendent selection process because it's completely, nobody looks to the Department of Education and say, I wonder what they're thinking about for schools. They say, Governor, what are you going to do about education? The governor in Michigan is only one of 13 states, where I think it's 13, or maybe it's even 12 now, it's, it's a small number, where the governor neither appoints the superintendent or the Board of Education. The governor should have the direct appointment of the state superintendent so that that could become part of a governor's administration, and, and that's a mess today. Another question? Right there, please. Good morning, my name is Brenda. I'm a business owner in Michigan, and I live in Grand Haven, but I'm heading to Lansing tonight. I sit on the board of the Michigan Inventors Coalition. There are a lot of incubators in place here in West Michigan. In my humble opinion, I think we have some of the strongest innovative minds in the nation right here. Do you see anything happening with innovation nationally or even at a statewide level that can be promising for me to convey tonight during our meeting? Well, uh, again, I think that's, I don't think government, I, I think you're right, you've got the innovative people. Uh, we need to give you the best possible environment to succeed in. Uh, I, I think that, you know, so that means what's the tax and regulatory environment, how easy is it for someone to start a business, someone with an idea to go capitalize that business. Uh, and I think there are things that we can do much better. One of the studies, we, we do a lot of studies and we, that's one of the enjoyable things about the Business Roundtable is we have the resources to actually go out and look at questions. One of the studies that we just released was really important because it talked about the imbalance 
uh, of the U.S. tax code compared to other nations. And, and it pointed out that if simply our, our tax rate is 35, and in 86 that was the lowest. Today it's the highest of all the industrial nations we could be with. Ten points above the average, actually. Our legislation that we're working for, would, I, I, I hate saying this, but I said, you know, it's hard to rally people. Let's really work hard and we can get to be average. But, but in reality, that's if we could get the U.S. rate down to 25 versus 35 and fix the international problem, it makes us a lot more competitive. What's that mean for, say, a small business or a small in entrepreneur or innovator? Uh, we, we discovered that, and this was a study done by EY, that we are net negative about $200 billion in mergers and acquisitions cross-border. In other words, we've been having a sale in America of innovative and creative companies to enterprises headquartered elsewhere in the world. The study said if you'd, if you'd had a 25% rate versus a 35% rate, there might have been 1,300 fewer U.S. companies bought. We said, well, is that a big deal? Well, the median size of these companies is about, uh, was about 30 million. So in other words, a lot of these are pretty small companies. And what's, what's been happening is, is that even if a U.S. company is bidding against, say, a German company, the tax advantages are so heavily weighted to the foreign company, they can pay more than the U.S. company. And so we're seeing some of these best future assets. And the point we're making is if, if simply one of those 1,300 companies, assume that number's right, if one of those becomes the next Google with a $300 billion market cap, we've kind of lost the whole advantage. You know, we would gain back what everybody would say we've, we've lost. And so we, we need that fixed. We need the, the regulatory climate fixed. We're, <coughs> We, we think those are all things that are important. I think states can play a role. One other thing that, that I think is really important, and, and Vern Ehlers, I should give a shout out to Vern, because he represented the kind of congressman you want to have in Congress. He was a hard working, represented the community, but he also understood larger issues. He was not narrow and, uh, and really uh, all about himself. Vern was involved in science and technology. And the nation, I think, still needs to continue to make an R&D investment and, and in basic science, basic research. I, I, and we've, we've started to see that leg. Uh, Peter McPherson, the former Michigan State University president, is down in Washington as the American Association of Public Universities. I mean, he's really a, one of the thoughtful voices on this, but there's a lot of effort being done. We need to, we need to bring that back. You don't know where that leads. But I'm telling you, there's good things out there if we, if we, and it's such a small amount of the budget. In Michigan right now, we have 12 innovative networks, soon to be 14. There are a lot of strong ideas. Mm -hmm. So if you can take kind of this question back to your people and really think it through, um, sure. there are phenomenal people out there that would love to keep their products homegrown. Yep. I, without it be a, a goal of the country. Yeah. The comment was that a lot of people here in Michigan would like to keep their products homegrown. I should uh, repeat the question, so just give me a chance to repeat your question from the audience so that everybody can hear it. Another question, please. JC. Yes, Governor, a couple of times you referred to international tax code comparison. Is there a nation we should aspire to emulate in that regard? Is there a country whose tax code we should emulate because they're promoting so much growth. Pretty much any other nation. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it's almost that bad. Uh, literally, I've had companies say, look, just, just if we took that country's code versus ours, we'd be better. I mean, Canada, you don't look very far. Uh, they've got a, I think they've got a 15% corporate rate. They've got, uh, or, let's see, 15, yeah, I think it's 15. And, and they've got uh, the R&D credit, another part of this. Uh, you know, R&D credit is expired now 16 times since we first passed it in the 80s. It was, in the 80s, it was best in the world. Today, it's, it's not even probably 25th best in the world, and it keeps expiring. So it's, it's, a, it's a dubious value. That's one of the things we think in tax reform. We make that permanent, try to make it a bit more robust, try to make it more meaningful for smaller enterprises. So that's, that's a big deal. But JC, to your question, is there another country? We've simply got it. We're the only nation that takes, we, here's our approach on international, just to give you a, a one, I do it 45 seconds. We, as a country, 
uh, competing with other countries, have the following policy. If you earn money in Germany, in France, in Ireland, you pay the taxes in those countries. And then you bring the money back. No, that's not quite right. You can take the money anywhere in the world, except if you bring it back to the United States, you then have to pay the difference between whatever tax rate you paid in that country, say it was 25%, and our rate is 35%, so you have to pay an additional 10%. If you're a German company, French company, Irish company earning money in the U.S., you pay your U.S. taxes, and that's it. You pay no more tax. And we're the only country that's trying to tax income twice. And, that, and that's a big deal. What that means is there's something like $2 trillion in foreign earnings that are held offshore. In other words, they, they've never brought the money back because if you bring it back, you get the higher tax. Now, what would be the temptation if your money is offshore, in other words, your money stays in Europe or it stays in Asia, and then immigration laws aren't fixed, you can't bring talent here, um, you, you might say, well, I'm, gee, the people are out there, the money's out there, maybe I should build a research center out there. Why would we have that policy? And, and uh, uh, so that's, that's what we're trying to change. And that, that we're, it's called a territorial or a, you know, a rate versus a global rate, and we, we, just, we have to fix that. I, it is not that hard to fix, it just takes, again, leadership. We're trying to do this really without, we're, we're saying the president's done all he needs to do because he's acknowledged as a problem. So thank you for acknowledging that, Mr. President. We are then going to try to give you a solution. Good. Another question? Another question? Yes, go ahead, Ambassador. I've never asked a question in my own breakfast series. <laughs> <laughs> this makes me nervous. This, this has always bothered me. On page two, you read about the logical argument the governor's given us that if our tax rates are not competitive, our companies earn money in other countries and have less remaining to spend on building a new plant in the third country, India or the Far East, because they have a, a smaller net. <coughs> Meanwhile, the other countries can earn the excess of net or excess net to what we earn and use it to buy our companies. So we have a two-way loss. We have less to distribute to our shareholders and we have a loss of companies. But then on the Fifth page, you read an article where some CEO has earned $300 million, twice what the Dominican Sioux just made. I'm not so sure I can compare the two, but the point is, it is devastating to those of us who believe in the logic that we have to cut tax rates and then read that some greedy CEO or some phenomenally talented CEO, which may be the case, but can't be the case in many of these issues, why they have to take such large income and embarrass the rest of us who are trying to make the business of the And I think it has to start with some of the people at the BRT. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. That's a question that uh, I see already getting some applause, but why do we have greedy CEOs? What to do about it? Uh, Governor. I think it was a statement, not a question. Uh, <laughs> That's why I'm here yeah. to ask the question. <laughs> yeah, so. No, I mean, I, you know, look, you know, that's that's up to the. I will tell you this: we we have nothing to do at the roundtable with the compensation of anybody uh, in any of our member companies, and I want to keep it that way. I, I, you know, we shouldn't set it, nor should the government. But I, I think your point is what our boards of directors are doing, because. Uh, Last time I checked, the CEOs can't set their own salaries, and uh, one of the reasons that this is all, I think, a, a matter of conversation is that uh, through the SEC, there's a lot more transparency. I mean, the Compensation Committee reports now are in, in great detail in everybody's proxy statements. It's not just what cash compensation is, but what the value of future options are, and all of that. It's all laid out. Uh, and I, my, my view on that is that you know, there's a, there's a reasonableness test that ought to be applied. And, uh, you know, but that's, there's a, uh, it's, it's not what we do. So, uh, you know, the shareholder activists like Mr. Sexton can, uh, can jump in there and uh, go to work on that. But that, that to me is, you know, it's sort of like saying, well, 
gee, we can fix the budget problems if we could just tax, you know, we can just tax the rich and we get the 1%. Whatever that is would run the government for a fraction of time. I mean, this, this, it is a distractor from the conversation about economic growth. I, believe me, I understand it's a factor. Uh, and it is, it is what it is, but it's not, it is a central issue that, that we're working on because uh, sort of regardless of what's happening with incomes at the upper level, the incomes that matter are middle class and people aspiring to move up, and, and those have stagnated and those need to do better. And you see when the economy gets better, companies ranging from a TJ Maxx to a Walmart to a Aetna raise wages in order to contain, or to, you know, to keep their workforce intact. Uh, today they're trading so much of the time with a workforce, they want to keep that work, worker in place once they're trained, so that's that put upward pressure. But we got a long way to go. So there's a question behind Yes, there's a question there. right there. We should have taken that one first anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, recently reading an article about uh, the topic of new business starts. And right now, new business starts for the millennial generation, the younger generation is way down as um, in regard to uh, past generations. Why do you believe that's the case? And um, should we should we be concerned about that right now, or uh, your thoughts? Please? Well, the question, I, the question is: oh, New question business is, starts are down. Should we be concerned? Well, particularly with regard to millennials and younger people starting businesses, and you know, I wonder if the 08, 09 recession has uh, had an impact on it. Mitch Daniels, the president of Purdue, gave an interesting speech. And you know where he tied it back to? And I, I hadn't thought of it. I thought it was a very interesting approach. He said, look at the debt that, that people are leaving school with today, and how much that's risen. And he said, how much is that putting a damper on just what you've mentioned, startups? And how much risk can I take when I've got this overhang of debt? So I'm going to have, I better get something where I can get started on the debt. And so I'm deferring that, that opportunity uh, until later, until I'm financially feeling a little more like I, I, I can manage it. And I, I hadn't thought of it, but he was, he was making a good case, and he, was, and he had a correlation, actually, as student debt had risen, how sort of innovation, you know, how career choices were changing, that people were opting. And, uh, boy, that's a, that, that is an interesting approach. And it may be the recession itself. I, I suspect that you know, some of it may be regulatory, but I, but I think that's not, I don't think, I don't think most people, you know, question over here earlier about innovation, I'm not sure if everyone's in their garage or their basement saying, well, man, I want to start this business, but is the government going to show up here and stop me? I, I mean, I, I think it comes in at a point, but I'm not sure on the front end. I just talked to a young man last week who, uh, while he was in business school, actually started a business that he had started working in when as, as a teenager and ends up building into a business and sells it for many millions of dollars. He's on to his next new thing, which is also pretty cool. But uh, one other factor in this, uh, a lot of business startups in the country is, in, the, in recent years have been done by new citizens, people new to America. And, and again, it, it is part of the argument for uh, the right immigration policies because there's a much higher propensity of a new person the country starting a business and there is native born. We're oddly enough, I mean, something like half the companies in Silicon Valley are started by non US born citizens. We're going to have time for one or two more questions. So let me make sure we're getting a good represent. Yes, back in the back part of the room there. Me, Klaus, go. Thank you. Thank the you. question is about students here getting an education to uh, go into business in other countries and the issue of workers' rights in those countries. What advice would the governor have? Well, I, 
I would hope the Seidman College has a, a course that would help with that. I, I don't. Uh, I don't have enough familiarity with what goes on in other other countries to, to be able to competently answer your question, but it, but it is something. Uh, I mean, two elements to it. I mean, one obviously that's that's a great subject for it. So in the business school to be focused on being able to teach about. It's also an argument for why one wants to travel more to get some exposure to see what is going on in these other countries. But I, but I, I'm sorry, I can't do a better job of that question. Hey, we do have, I think, time for one more question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, as the political landscape goes, as, as the political landscape goes from the far right to the far left, there seems to be no middle left. Uh, could you give us an example where you were able to reach across the aisle, public <coughs> service, and work together? And how can we foster that in the future? Well, well in Michigan, there's quite great a question. How can we get people to work across the aisle? Great question, sir. I think there's, there's quite a few of them. I mean, we did it on a transportation package. We, we passed a gas tax with Nickel back when. Uh, this You're talking about when I was governor. Right. Yeah. Uh, we did some things with uh, Cobo Hall refinancing. Actually, the emergency manager laws that now have been much dramatically improved. But we actually wrote the first emergency manager laws for uh, public schools and for municipalities. We didn't do a very good job because we, we were trying to we were trying to figure it out. We hadn't done it before and didn't know how, how much <coughs> we had. Uh, but but that, was a, that was very much a, a bipartisan. In fact, that one, we even had, we did a, there was just a few Republican votes and a lot of Democratic votes to, to get that done. That was when I was, that was the Senate leader at that time. As governor, I'd cite transportation. Uh, we ended up doing a lot of things on, on budgets that turned out to be bipartisan at the end of the day. Much of what we did in welfare reform ended up to be bipartisan. It started out uh, with uh, a, I would say, a, a slim margin, and then it became, I think, as as people as it unfolded, people saw that it that it began to it worked. Um, and I think the other thing that we would look at, which is kind of interesting, these are all wonky topics, maybe, but during our tenure, we were able to rewrite and recodify the public health code and the environmental code in Michigan. And uh, one thing that was especially you know, pleasing is that we took the state administrative code, in other words, rules and regulations from three volumes down to two. So about a third of the rules and regulations, and a lot of them were obsolete. Others need to be rewritten and updated. And so we did a, we did a lot of that stuff that was kind of behind the scenes that, uh, that, made, a, that made a big difference. Uh, I did see Senator Meekoff with his hand up. I hate to let the right. majority leader go. Uh, well, that was a question. Thank you, yes, sir. Thank you, Governor. Uh, noting your leadership over three uh, terms as governor, and then there was an aberration in between there, and now we have a Republican governor again. Uh, noting also that 2018 is not that far off, and there'll probably be a host of potential members of either the Senate or the House or other business people that want to run for governor for the state of Michigan. What were, would be the one, two, or three items you would tell them that is the most important for them to know about being governor of the state of Michigan? What are the three things that are most important to know about being governor of the state of Michigan since we have an election in 2018? Oh, actually, uh, well, you have to have more votes than the other guy to win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you got to figure that out. But, but I, I think that uh, I, I think that uh, the landscape's going to be. It, it's almost hard to say. Right now, just get get prepared, learn things. I mean, you know, but it, it, Peter was right. I mean, it was a very kind introduction, but unfortunately, I had a lot of time on the back bench, you know, because I was in the minority in the House for eight years, in the minority in the Senate for uh, four years, and then uh, one more on top of that. So I had basically 13 years in the minority. of, uh, And so you're, you know, sitting there in your mind under our government, what would we do? Uh, but I, I do think that the the budget the budget is about priorities, so I think that matters. But I I think that the state that can figure out its education system first is going to have a huge advantage. I mean, to me, that we, we cannot think about a company of your own if you were your your own budget. I mean, you know, the fact, you can't take twenty percent of our our people and not have them be productive and being able to contribute. 
I mean, this directly impacts your human services cost, your prison system, all of this stuff. We, we've got to get the education system right. And we're spending, as I said, as a nation, $700 billion, the, the expenditures in this state have gone up dramatically. That, that's, where, that's where the focus has got to be. And, we, and I'm telling you, you, we should have a debate. I am for higher standards. We, you know, these, they're goofing around in Washington. They're going to ban Common Core. Uh, well, Common Core has been mis, you know, misunderstood from the beginning. It really is, it was Common Core, you know, state standards. It's the state standards part of it was key. And where did those come from? Governors and state education leaders. We were trying to develop something. It matters in Michigan to be able to say we've got better schools than we've got in Ohio and in Indiana. How do we prove it? We have a situation in America today, 50 states, they're all in the top half. <laughs> Think about that. How is that possible? Well, we ought to be able to sort it out and answer that question. Great. Governor, thank you very much for a good conversation. Thank you. Like Mr. Governor, thank you for, for coming. Uh, one, one quick announcement. There are some uh, keys that uh, Bill Smith has. In case you lost them, you can get those after the program, please. Um, let me uh, start off uh, this way, just wrapping up uh, our conversation. Uh, first off, uh, the majority leader is here. Uh, I'd like to recognize him as well. Thank you for being here, sir. We also have one of our uh, current board members here, Megan Saul. Please stand up to be recognized. And of course, uh, Joan and Peter, uh, this is the last of this year as we look ahead uh, to uh, years ahead as well. But your support has made a difference in the college, but also throughout the university. And we are appreciative of that. Please. Uh, I heard a few words, investment, time and again, talent, time and again, education, time and again, leadership, time and again. And uh, I, I live by the uh, adage that uh, uh, decisions made today are tomorrow's reality. And uh, I know that uh, when the, the governor was uh, active, uh, he had a president here with uh, Don Lovers and then Mark after that. They made decisions on investment here in, uh, in the state of Michigan and here at the Grand Valley State University. And we're reaping those realities today, Mr. Governor, that, that we truly do appreciate. When you think about the investment in uh, the infrastructure uh, and then uh, attracting good students, uh, that does give us a return on investment, without a doubt. In fact, uh, next uh, month, uh, we're going to have a commencement. We will celebrate the 100,000th alum from Grand Valley State University. Pretty remarkable, because 50 years ago, we didn't have any. <laughs> and on top of that, we will have, uh, this year alone, uh, we will have 5,600 grads uh, joining the workforce, uh, uh, starting a career, going to grad school and all, and 86% are staying right here in Michigan. That's reality, that's today's reality. So, Mr. Governor, without the, that uh, foresight that you had uh, many years ago, and uh, we met in 1992, actually, first time, when I was working in a school just south of here with Dieter Hanneke. And uh, he introduced me to you at that time, along with some others in Lansing. And uh, all I could say is, wow, we have some great leadership here in the state of Michigan. And so I'm very appreciative of uh, uh, the governor uh, coming here and uh, uh, sharing his uh, insights uh, with us, <coughs> perspectives, uh, and again, remember those words of, of an investment and, and talent development and, and the like, because we're going to make those decisions. And I, what I'd really like to do is I have a presentation to make, but I want to have our students stand up. Please stand up. Any Grand Valley State University student, please stand up. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our future. This is what we're investing in. So in 20 years from now, 
when we're still at this uh, breakfast, we will be celebrating great news, and I'm sure we will be. Uh, if you could join me here, sir. I have a, uh, a gift. A gift for you. Let me read this. Uh, the Seidman College of Business. Uh, Dean Larson, thank you for, for being here. The Seidman College of Business, on behalf of the Peter F. Secchi Breakfast Lecture Series, will make a contribution uh, of a uh, hydrid biosand water filter in your name to pure water for the world, world in Honduras, an outreach hosted by Cascade Engineering uh, Trip Quest in honor of Governor John Engler. His contribution in your name will greatly improve the health and families and children in Honduras. Thank you. Again, thank you. Okay, uh, we, walk, we uh, wish you a, a great uh, uh, day. The, the sun is out and spring might be in the air. So everyone uh, have safe travels. Thank you for being here.